Open with me now in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 1. And we're going to begin this new study in the prophecies of the prophet Zechariah. Two books before the end of the Old Testament there. (coughs) Excuse me. Zechariah chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 21 here tonight. Now, in the first six chapters of this prophecy, these prophecies of Zechariah, you have eight visions that are given to this prophet. So, first six chapters, eight visions. In the last eight chapters, you have just simply the word of the Lord that came to Zechariah. So, these eight visions, it appears, as you read through this, were all given to him in one night. Now, if that isn't a sensory overload, I don't know what is. But he wrote them all down so that we could read them, so that we could hear and know the mind of the Lord. And so, these prophets, or prophecies, these prophecies basically were given to, to warn to, and to encourage the children of Israel. To warn them, to reprove them, and to motivate them to new action. And so the prophet Zechariah also prophesied with the prophet Haggai. In Ezra chapter 5 verse 1, there they are mentioned together as prophesying to the nation Israel. It says, Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, the prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. And so they are mentioned together because they prophesied together at the same time. Now, if you look at this first verse here in chapter 1, it says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius. Now, if you look at Haggai, you will see that he began his ministry in the sixth month of the second year of Darius. So, the, he begins his ministry just two months after Haggai begins his. Now, you remember, the prophet Haggai called the people to repentance two months before this prophecy is given. And yet here, the prophet Zechariah does the exact same thing. He calls the people to repentance. So why is that? Well, it means that the, the previous repentance was not complete. That the people had not fully returned to the Lord. And so that's why this prophet speaks to them again here in these first six verses. Let's just read them. It says, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berchia, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, or the Lord Almighty, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers... Where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, they did not overtake, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, Just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with with us. And so here is this call to repentance that is given first to these people. Before they are to hear the word of the Lord, they must have a heart 
that is receptive and ready to hear his word. And so that's why he begins with this call to repentance, which is, I believe, a very essential thing for any believer to have that right heart before him. Now notice it says here in verse 2, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Now today, people, they don't want to talk about the anger of the Lord or the wrath of God. They just want to talk about the love of God and the mercy of God. That's all they want to talk about. Yet, this prophet and the scriptures as a whole, I mean, there are, I think there's over 600 times in the scripture where it speaks about the anger of the Lord. So, God speaks about this issue over and over again. He declares his anger towards his people. Now, the the scriptures say that he is slow to anger. And that is a good thing. I'm very thankful that he is slow to anger. He is of great patience and he is slow to wrath. And so he is, yet he will not hold his anger forever. Uh, The scripture says in Genesis 6 where, where God is about to destroy the world through a worldwide flood. He said there, that he will not always strive with man forever. And so God is striving with men, seeking to turn men back to him. And that's what he does here. He reminds them that all of the calamities that have taken place with the nation Israel have occurred because that God was very angry with them. Why was he very angry with them? Because of their idolatry and their rebellion and their destruction of one another and their robbing one another. They're hurting one another. And so all of these sins that were committed against each other and the sins that were committed against him, it just basically built up, built up until finally God said, it's done, I'm going to bring judgment. The same thing is going to take place with our world. God is patiently waiting for repentance among his people. Repentance among this world. And when the final time, when that final day comes, he's going to say it's over. And judgment will fall. And that is what is described in the book of Revelation in the, the last book in the New Testament. And the Lord then will come and set up his kingdom here upon the earth. So God is holy and he is just, but he is also merciful and gracious and slow to anger. But he will not hold that anger forever. And he will judge. Now it's interesting here that in verse 2, he says the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. And then in verse 3, He says, return to me. So here's the compassion of God. Here's the graciousness of God right next to the anger of the Lord. So can you put those together? Absolutely you can. In the New Testament, when there was a man in a synagogue with a withered hand and the Pharisees watched to see whether Jesus would heal him or not, The scripture says that Jesus looked around at them with anger. With anger. Why? Because of their hypocrisy. Because they should have known better. And yet these guys were just looking to trap him. That's it. But it says he looked around at them with anger, being grieved in his heart. Do you see the two, two issues there as well? You see the... Anger of the Lord, his righteousness and justice, but also his grief, his concern, his compassion toward them. He was grieved in his heart. And so here in verse 3, he says to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me. Now, I love this because he places the responsibility 
for returning and reconciling the relationship upon them. It's their responsibility. Now, you might say, well, why is that? Shouldn't the Lord do everything? No. He's not going to do everything. He's already been patient with them, already called them, already spoken his word to them, and now he says, it's your turn to respond. Return to me. And that is the way you keep that balance in your own life, in your own relationship. The Lord has sent his son to pay the price for my sins and the sins of the world. And now he commands all men to do what? Repent and return. To come back to him and to return into a right relationship with him. Notice he says here, return to me. Not return to the synagogue or return to church. He says, return to me. You see, he wants a personal relationship with his people. He wants every one of us in this room to have a personal relationship with him. Now, I can't give you that personal relationship. There's nobody that's uh, your spouse or your friend cannot give you that personal relationship. You have to cry out and ask for it. That's what you have to do. It's your decision. It's your choice. But if you want it, he is ready to give it. So he says, return to me. This is what it's all about. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, there the Lord says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Isn't that interesting? He said they have committed two evils, one, they have forsaken me. And two, they have just literally hewn out a cistern for themselves. And what is a cistern? It's where you store water. And he's saying, no, come to me. I'm the fountain of living water. I'm where you're going to get the fresh touch, fresh drink of living water. That's why Jesus said, come to me and drink. And you're going to be satisfied. So Jesus says the very same thing as what the Old Testament scriptures declare. God is a fountain of living water. He is the one who satisfies. But you have to come to him. It can't be religion. It can't be, you know, some external right ritual that you perform. It's you have to come to him in faith. One on one, you and him alone. And that's where that life is going to come from. It's not coming from any other place. So return to me. If you feel far from the Lord tonight, return to him because he will receive you. In Psalm 50, verse 15, there the Lord says, call upon me. Not call upon the church or call upon some ritual to save you. No, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. If you've called upon the name of the Lord, then you have been saved. If you call upon the Lord and the name of the Lord when you are in trouble, you will be delivered. He will guide you, but it requires you to cry out to him. Now, many times when I counsel with people and they say to me, Steve, you know what, I'm just, I'm just not doing well. I'm just I'm trying to determine God's will in my life. I'm trying to determine his direction for my life. Or I'm, I'm trying to deal with some issue, whatever it is. And I just don't seem like I'm getting anywhere. You know what I encourage people to do? I go, go out and spend the day alone and pray and fast and seek the Lord. Well, I don't have time to do that. I've got to, I've got to work. I've got things to do. Well, that's what the problem is. You see, I'm not pursuing him. And that is what I would encourage you to do. Pursue him. Call upon him 
and he will answer. Because the Lord doesn't want to judge people. He wants them to return to him. That's why he starts this message with this encouragement. Return to me, and what will he do? He will return to you. And so that relationship will be restored. But I must pursue him. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, there the Lord says, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? So this is God's call over and over again to his people. He's saying, turn. I, ha- I, I don't get any pleasure out of judging people. He doesn't get any pleasure out of seeing somebody go to hell. He gets pleasure in giving you the kingdom. That's what he gets pleasure out of. The scripture Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, he said, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And how can you please him? That's what his pleasure is, is to give to you. Well, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So, You must come to him believing with true faith. And when you do, you're going to receive. Now notice here also, he warns them about delay in their repentance. He says to them in the text here, he said, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways. Turn when? Now, not next week, not next month, now, right now. You see, this is what happens so often. I see people, they procrastinate, they wait, they just think, oh, it'll get better tomorrow, but it doesn't get better tomorrow. They, they're hoping that something will change and, and they don't really have to humble themselves and pursue the Lord and put him first in their life. And the result is nothing is going to change. If you say nothing is changing in my life, I guarantee you, you are not pursuing him in faith. If you pursue him in faith, something is going to change and it's going to radically change. And so I encourage you, today, turn today. Not next week, not tomorrow. Tonight, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. Notice the Lord says there, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Today. You see, there is the, the Holy Spirit speaking urgency. He's saying, do it today. Do it now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, the scripture says. So do it now and encourage others to take that action of repentance or faith or stepping out in obedience to whatever God has called them to do. Those are the issues that we need to change and deal with on a daily basis. And so he says here that the fathers, their fathers did what? Notice at the end of verse 4. But they did not hear nor heed me. So wherever you see the word hear, it always implies heeding or obeying. Wherever you see the word heed, it always implies hearing because you have to put those two together. So here in this verse, you see them both placed together. So when Jesus said, blessed are your ears for they hear, you see, It implies an obedience because you hear and you have followed. And that's what the disciples did. They heard his call to come follow him and they obeyed it. And so he tells them here, they did not hear nor heed me. They. Notice Jesus places the responsibility on the Pharisees. He says to them in in John 5.40, 
you will not come to me that you might have life. And here in this text, God does the very same thing. He says, they did not heed me, heed or hear my, my command. So this is, this is where we struggle. This is where the battle it lies. It lies in hearing his voice. And so the question is, do you hear his voice? And if you, then if you do hear his voice and you know what the Lord is commanding you to do, then do you obey his voice? So if, and both of those have to take place. If they don't both take place, then I am choosing not to obey. I'm not choosing to respond. And the result will always be the same. So notice he asked them here two questions. He said in verse 5, your fathers, where are they? Well, the answer to that is they're all dead. They're all dead. Why? Because the judgment of God came on the nation Israel and they all were killed in judgment and they were taken to, the rest of them were taken into Babylon and they all, that whole generation died there in Babylon. And so, where are your fathers? Well, they're all dead. And then he asked the question, and the prophets, do they live forever? No. The answer is obviously no. No, no prophet is going to live forever. Anybody in this physical body is, has a very short period of time. The scripture calls it a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. And so, his, what is his point? His point is, your fathers are dead because of the judgment that has come against them. The prophets that warned them and predicted this, they've all died as well, but my word has been fulfilled. That's his point. He says, yet, surely, verse 6, my words and my statutes which I commanded, my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Yeah, they did overtake your fathers. The words of God, the predictions of the scripture are going to come to pass. Whether I believe them or not, they are going to come to pass. This is what the Lord warns his people over and over again. Ezekiel twelve twenty five. He says, for I am the Lord. I speak and the word which I speak will come to pass. Not might come to pass, will come to pass. It will no more be postponed for in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it, says the Lord God. So when God says something, he means it. He means it, and it will come to pass. It's not going to be changed. Oh, for me, there's a special dispensation. Uh, I'm going to get out of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to escape. No, it's not going to be that way. Every single person is going to experience the very same thing. That's the way it is. That's the only way it could be fair, correct? If... if that doesn't take place, then God is not fair. But if you humble yourself and repent and turn to him and obey him, what takes place in that life? God's blessing. God's work, the work of his spirit takes place in that life. That's what's going to occur every single time. And so I encourage you, heed his voice. Heed his word. And it says, notice, and so they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined, according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he dealt with us. In other words, they, they, they saw the, the truth of what Zacharias is, is, has been telling them. And so Zechariah tells them here, this is the truth, this is what's going to happen, and they respond. Now we come to the first of, the, of two of these eight visions that we're going to look at. The first two are here in this latter part of this chapter. In verse 7, it says, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shebat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, 
the son of Berechia, the son of Iddo, the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees and in the hollow, and behind him were horses, that is plural, many horses, red, sorrel, or actually speckled, and white. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, so notice there's an angel standing and instructing Zechariah as to what the meaning of this, this vision is. But there is another, the, another man standing among the myrtle trees, verse 10, answered and said, These are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord. So this man that is sitting on this red horse is described here in verse 11 as the angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord. And it says, who stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro throughout the earth. And behold, all the earth is resting quietly. So first off, who is this angel of the Lord? That's essential to understanding this, this particular prophecy. The angel of the Lord is what is described as a christ in It is an appearance of of God in the flesh of a man before the incarnation of Christ. You have this example. There are many places. Joshua stood before the the captain of the Lord's host. And this was the angel of the Lord. The word angel simply means messenger. That's it. So in some contexts, it's talking about just one of God's angels. In other contexts, it's talking about the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that that is the case? Well, go along with me a little further over to chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. Notice here that the angel of the Lord is described as Jehovah specifically. In this text, he says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you. So this angel of the Lord is clearly the Lord himself. Then one more little key to this is verse 3. Notice that the angel of the Lord forgives a man's sins. Who can do that but God alone? It says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel or the messenger. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. And I will clothe you with rich robes. So the only person who can remove your iniquity from you is the Lord. That's it. So clearly this angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. So the man riding on this red horse is the Lord. And there are many horses behind him coming up upon him, as we'll see here. And it says, verse 12, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts. So now here, Jesus is speaking to the Father. O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which you were angry these 70 years? And the Lord answered, and the angel who talked with him, with good and comforting words. Oh, I love that. As, how many times has the Lord spoken to you good and comforting words when you are tweaked, 
when you are down, when you are discouraged and depressed. Oh, I love that. At verse 14, so the angel who spoke with me said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. So the nations that destroyed Israel are all at ease. They're all resting. They're all enjoying their the, what they've conquered. And yet the Lord says now, I'm angry with them because they're at ease. And they have destroyed my people. He says, for I was a little angry and they helped, these nations helped to judge his people, but with evil intent. In other words, they went way beyond what his intention was for their judgment. He says, therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. Now, for the Lord to return to Jerusalem with mercy, that means that the Jews have returned to him. Go back to chapter 3, or verse 3. Remember, return to me, and I will return to you. So here the Lord is promising that he will return to them. So their repentance, obviously, is complete. He says, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. He says, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. He says, again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. So here he is declaring that God is going to bring prosperity and uh, comfort and mercy upon Jerusalem and upon Judah. And so the, this is an incredible encouragement. So in this vision, Zechariah is seeing that there is, there is something going on behind the scenes. The Lord has sent the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, Jesus Christ. And he is coming and he is going to come with zeal against the countries and the nations that have destroyed and scattered his people. And so this is an encouragement to, to Zechariah. It's an encouragement that he wants proclaimed to the people so that they will have encouragement so that they can see that there is a future plan that God has for his people. Now, who doesn't want to know that? I hope every one of you wants to know that God has a plan and he is working that plan out in your life and in your family. He is, he is at work right now. In Jeremiah 29, 11, one of the most famous passages, you all know it well. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, God spoke that through the prophet Jeremiah while the people of Israel were still in captivity. So God had a plan in their captivity, and he has a plan after their captivity. Because Zechariah and Haggai are prophets proclaiming God's word to this people, having now come back into the land after their captivity in Babylon. And so this is an encouragement that he has great zeal. Great zeal. I love that. He is, he is motivated in judgment. He is motivated in restoration and mercy and healing what has been torn. Now, the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy will, of course, only be found ultimately in the millennial reign of Christ. When he sets up his kingdom, this will be completely, ultimately fulfilled. 
Yes, he is saying that he is returning to them now. And he is going to bless them now. But it has a ultimate fulfillment in that one day Jesus is going to come and he's going to remove all of the, the, the nations that have fought against his people. Because there are nations fighting against his people right now that want to destroy them. I mean, all I have to do is just read the, the statements of the imams and the uh, in the Middle East today, or the supreme leader of in Iran. Just listen to their statements. They want to destroy Israel. And they will do anything in their power to do that. And that, that battle is coming soon. And so get ready for it. Then, the next vision is from verses 18 through 21. He says, then I raised my eyes and looked. So in each one of these chapters, in each one of these visions, you'll see this statement, and then I, and so it appears that all of these visions all came about in this one night. So that's where you get that concept. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And so he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, or literally workmen. And he said, I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah, so that no one could lift up his head, but the craftsmen, or the workmen, are coming to terrify them, these nations, these kingdoms, and to cast out the horns of nations. Notice he's, just, he's actually um, defining for you what these horns are. They're nations. He said, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Now, this particular vision is a little difficult to understand, but let's just break it down little by little. First, the horns. What are these horns that are described here in this particular text? The horn is something that is used throughout the Old Testament in symbolic or uh, in imagery throughout prophecies and uh, visions that you will find in the Old Testament. A horn is described in, in, you have to look at it in the context. Sometimes a horn is a literal horn, okay? Uh, the horn on a, you know, a, uh, you know, the horns of a gazelle or the horns of, you know, a goat or something like that. They're talking about literal horns. But when he's talking in prophetic terms, they are a symbol of something else. Horns, of course, what, what does an animal use a horn for? Fighting, right. It gives them power and authority to, to basically you know, take care of themselves or take care of their prey. And so a horn is used symbolically to indicate invincible strength and authority over others. It is also used of kingdoms or of kings individually. So let me show you this in the scripture. In Micah chapter 4, verse 13. So this is a passage where God uh, speaks, if you look, read the context, he is speaking about bringing the nations that hate Israel to his threshing floor, that he is going to judge them. And it's, he uses this imagery of, of like harvesting wheat and taking this wheat into his threshing floor and basically beating it and stomping on it and he says this is with that in your mind this is what he says to Israel Micah 4:13 arise and thresh o daughter of zion for i will make your horn iron so your authority your power will be like iron it's not going to be out of bone. It's going to be of iron. 
and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples. I will consecrate their grain. And what's their grain? Well, notice he says in the next part, he says, and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. So they're going to be conquered and Israel is going to do the conquering. And so God says, I'm going to give you a horn that is invincible. It's, it's going to be like iron. Your hooves are going to be like bronze. I mean, you put a, a bronze hoofed animal into the threshing floor, I'm guaranteeing you, it's going to pulverize anything that it's stomping on. And that's the image that he's giving to them here. He, they're going to pulverize the nations that have destroyed them and scattered them. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, notice here, it says, the ten horns are the ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Now that's in the midst of another prophecy concerning the end times. And so he's speaking here about ten horns. Uh, on this beast that he sees in this vision. These ten horns are ten kings or ten kingdoms. And so in this particular context, he's using the, this image as ten kingdoms or nations. We, we determined that by the end, right down there at the end of verse 21, where it says, to cast out the horns of the nations. So these horns are kingdoms. So once you've got that clearly established in your mind, these are the Gentile kingdoms that have destroyed and conquered and scattered the people of Israel. So this goes right along with the previous vision. Remember, the Lord came on the red horse and said, all these nations are sitting here and they're at ease. They're just kicking back and enjoying the fruits of their victory. But the Lord says, I'm angry with them and I'm going to destroy them. And so this is the image, this is the point that he's trying to make with Zechariah that he might tell the people that he's prophesying to. God is going to take care of the Gentile nations that you're subject to. Because isn't that exactly what, where they were? They'd come back from captivity from Babylon, but they were still under the control of uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. And so Darius, uh, one, a Mede, he was in control of them at that time. And the Lord is saying, they're going to be taken care of. I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to take care of them. Their horn is going to be destroyed. So he says here, I saw and I looked and there were four horns. So what are these four horns? Well, they're four nations. Four nations that have destroyed the nation Israel. So who are the four nations? Well, it's easy. I mean, all you have to do is just look at the record of history. Who are the four nations that destroyed the nation Israel prior to them coming back into the land. These four nations were Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, and the Medo-Persians. So you have four nations that he says, I'm going to deal with. I'm going to deal with them. And I'm going to bring them to their end. And then he says, he uses here, verse 20, the Lord showed me four craftsmen. You say, well, what do these craftsmen have to do with this, this whole destruction of these nations? And he's basically saying here that these horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head, but the craftsmen are coming to terrify them. So he's talking about succeeding nations that are going to come and destroy the preceding nation. And yet, he doesn't describe them as horns. He describes them as workmen. 
as his workmen. You see, again, many times you'll see when God speaks about bringing Babylon, God calls Babylon his servant or his workman. He is coming, he's sending them to destroy that nation, which many of the prophets, one of the, the prophet uh, Habakkuk, he, he, was, he, was, he struggled with this. He says, how can this be? That you're going to take a more evil nation to destroy your own nation. And God explained to him, you don't know what I'm doing. If I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't be able to comprehend it. You wouldn't even believe it. And so then these craftsmen come. There are succeeding nations that cast out the ones that are before it, that have scattered Israel. Who are these nations? Well, the, these nations would be Babylon, Medo, the Medo-Persian and the Grecian and Roman empires. So the Babylon, Babylonian Empire, they are the ones who destroyed Israel. The Babylonian Empire was destroyed by the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire was destroyed by the Grecian Empire. And then the Grecian Empire destroyed by the Romans. And so again, you've got four horns, four craftsmen, four workmen seeking to destroy the nations that have destroyed his nation. Now, this particular prophecy, I think, really just reveals that there's always somebody tougher on the block than you are. And the Lord has the ability to send somebody tougher to take you down. And, you know, I tell you, our nation thinks that we're invincible. And I guarantee you, we are not. And... There are many different ways our nation could be taken down. Our nation could be taken down by a, a terrorist attack, a coordinated terrorist attack in our major cities. I mean, if chemical or, God forbid, a, a nuclear attack of some kind, uh, we, we could be taken down in one, one hour. Or if you have a financial collapse, in our nation. Is that possible? Oh, with $20 trillion in debt and, you know, billions of dollars every day, every day being added to that debt. One day we're going to have to pay the piper. So there are many ways that God can take us down. So you better be on your knees praying for an awakening in our land because that's the only thing that will save us. Because the pride of our nation is quite obvious. And so be, be looking at the scripture as your example. But the point here is that God has a plan, a plan that is beyond your understanding, beyond your ability to comprehend it. This is why the people were discouraged. And God sent this prophet with these visions to proclaim these truths to them that they might know I have a plan, I am in control, and I'm going to fulfill my plan. And history tells us he did it. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that, Lord, what you speak, you will do. Father, what you have promised, you will perform. And so, Lord, I, I pray tonight that, Lord, you would have mercy upon our nation, that you would bring humility to the hearts of our people. Lord, that you would bring that awakening to our land. Because, Lord, our nation is ripe for judgment. We are ripe. And I, I pray that you would, Lord, bring about your plan, fulfill it, however you see fit. And Lord, I pray that we, each one of us here would be a light in these dark days, in these last days. Help us to speak your word, speak the truth to those that we come in contact with. Make us your light. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.